Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Recently, on Sunday, October 11th, I hosted a live stream on YouTube, a live stream event titled, uh, Ask Your Toughest Questions. And it ran for 90 minutes. And I went through uh, four pages worth of toughest questions that had been uh, presented to me by, by, by the moderators who work with me. However, the total list of questions ran for 40 pages and there were many good ones. So, I thought what I would do um, is to take advantage of all of these good questions and uh, continue to answer them as time permits and uh, post them on uh, the In Presence monologue. So, that's what I'm about to do now. And I'm going to start with a, a question posed by James Conroy who asks, what was my most profound spiritual experience. And uh, I can say I've had many, uh, <laughs> starting probably with my first LSD trip back in the late 1960s. However, I think the most profound spiritual experience, and I'm reminded of it every day, is simply being here at all, being alive, being conscious, being here and now. You know why I call the In Presence series In Presence? It has to do with that appreciation of being here now. Nothing really is more profound than that. Uh, the Real Matthews asks, what is our best evidence for life after death? And uh, for me, I would say the best evidence is uh, what are known as the cross correspondences. And that is when a deceased communicator wants to establish that they have an autonomous existence independent of any single living person, they prepare communications that come through multiple mediums. And in, in the best of those instances, the communications interlock in some way so that they make sense of each other. And here's a real simple experience uh, of this sort of simple cross correspondence that occurred. Uh, and I discussed it recently in an in presence monologue about the great medium. Gladys Osborne Leonard. And it's a case in which, um, Mrs. Leonard is, uh, in trance. Uh, the physicist William Barrett, one of the founders of the Society for Psychical Research is deceased. His wife is having a session and, uh, with Mrs. Leonard. And uh, Barrett comes through the session and he says, I am also communicating with someone else, another medium, presumably, who is far, far away. That's all he said, but it, it does suggest uh, to expect a message from another medium. Well, in the United States, across the ocean, Mrs. Piper was uh, communicating. Mrs. Piper is the Eleonora Piper, the medium who was discovered by William James in Boston and uh, who uh, has been also studied extensively. And Barrett came through her and he had a message for a Mrs. Jarvis. Now, it turned out that um, when Mrs. Piper had been in England, she met Mrs. Jarvis. And uh, so, it wasn't uh, that unusual, I suppose, that uh, Barrett might have a message for her. And he says, I'm very sorry, I missed our appointment to have tea. Please, and Mrs. Piper reached out and said, I received a message from William Barrett saying this. Across the Atlantic, it came, the, the letter came to Mrs. Jarvis within a few weeks of the uh, message received uh, by Barrett's wife through Mrs. Leonard. So there's an example of, and some, many of the other cross correspondences are far more intricate. And, and complex. This is a simple example that suggests that Barrett was able to communicate independently through two different 
uh, mediums. And that's the sort of thing that I think, uh, provides, uh, better evidence than, than most cases because the alternative explanation to survival after death is what we call living agent psi. That is that Mrs. Leonard or Mrs. Piper are using their own ESP to produce this information. And, uh, you can't rule it out a hundred percent. That's one of the real problems with research on life after death. But I think the cross correspondences do provide our best evidence. And I have to say as well that, uh, it, while it's the, the best evidence, there are many other lines of evidence. We have evidence of apparitions, evidence from near death experience, evidence of reincarnation. So, uh, while uh, philosophers such as Michael Seduth and uh, Stephen Browdy point out that none of this evidence is airtight, we don't have an absolute proof for life after death, I think we keep coming closer and closer and closer. Thomas Kafka asks, do you think reptilian beings control the world? Now, uh, let me just say point blank, no, <laughs> but, but it's interesting. Where does this idea come from? <laughs> I, I've heard it said, I suppose one could say it's part of the Gnostic tradition that there are archons or, uh, beings, dark beings, beings who have no compassion, no sympathy, who are controlling the world. And, and you could think of it, I suppose, as a metaphor. Reptilian beings, probably a, a metaphor for people who have, uh, no compassion, no empathy, who are in it for their own power. And no doubt that the, many people in positions of power seek those positions precisely because that's, that's their highest ambition. Uh, but I don't think that they're in total control of the world at all. I think the world is, uh, a multiplicity of power centers and, um, many people who are, um, in positions of power are good conscientious people. And I, I would say that's probably the majority of people. Maybe it's just a bare majority, but it is a majority in my opinion. Arthur Ortega asks, how do you talk to someone with different views than, than you have? Like racism, how do you talk to somebody like that? And it's hard. I know it's hard, but I think it's very important to recognize that each human being, each sentient being is another version of yourself. And if you were born uh, and had their life experiences, you might very well have the same views that they had or that they do have. So uh, even though you disagree with their views, I think it's perfectly appropriate to be critical of other people's views and other people's behavior. But when it comes to the essence of who they are in their soul, in their spirit, they're the same as you. We all share the same spirit in my view. We're all one ultimately in my view at the level of pure conscious awareness. So I think it's good to keep that in mind. Another one of my personal guidelines is to treat all other people with respect. I learned that from working with the PK man, Ted Owens, who was a very difficult person to work with. Uh, one of my colleagues described him once as being like a grizzly bear with a burr up his ass. So, uh, he could be a dangerous person to be with, as a matter of fact, but I understood, uh, as well as from my work at San Quentin prison when I did group therapy work with murderers and rapists, that, uh, we have a lot more in common than, uh, <laughs> than there is that separates us, believe it or not. So, um, I hope that's helpful to you, Arthur. M.A. 
53N asks, how does one, quote, come out as having alternative ideas while demonstrating we are still able to be rational, especially among less open minds on either end of the spectrum, say hippies versus doctors? Well, uh, that's a great question, MA53N. And uh, it's one of the reasons that I host this particular YouTube channel, New Thinking Aloud, focusing mostly on parapsychology, because I see parapsychology as precisely the field that bridges these two worlds. It's a field that is very open to ancient alternative ideas about the nature of reality, the spiritual basis of reality. And at the same time, it's a field that exercises the scientific method. So, you have one foot in both camps as a parapsychologist. And I try to present that over and over and over again, that you can discuss ideas that are mind-boggling and far out and still use your critical intelligence. And in particular, still be mindful of what the empirical data has to say and, and where the empirical data doesn't yet go. Mooncat asks, sociologically, do you believe that our society is prepared to recognize that our world is home to ancient races being visited from other planets and being contacted from the plane of the dead? It's a great question, and I have to say that these are topics, of course, that I've covered on the New Thinking Aloud channel many times. And uh, we have a, a growing audience. We had millions of viewers and over now 87,000 subscribers as of uh, the date that I'm recording this monologue. So, I, I would say at least in part. Now, I don't think these ideas are yet mainstream, but they're moving in that direction. And they're certainly, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, there is widespread recognition that these are ideas today, right here and now. These are ideas worthy of our serious consideration. Juan Croco says, hello. It seems that we are very near civilization collapse or even human extinction. Are there any precognitions about what will happen next by psychics you know? And uh, I'm going to link right now, Juan, to an earlier interview I did with uh, Stefan Schwartz, a good friend, a person who has been interviewed on this channel many, many times. Uh, I did an interview with him titled Remote Viewing the Future. Now, I know he's still working on that project and still gathering data. So, uh, it's not as if that interview provides a final answer, but it does to me suggest that there is a pathway by which uh, people interested in uh, parapsychology can begin to seriously address the questions you raise. Armando Solarzano says, Dr. Mishlove, what do you think of the Western humanist philosophical tradition and Debashish Banerjee's critique of it? Well, I'm not sure offhand what particular critique you're referring to. But uh, Debashish is a good friend. I plan to conduct another interview with him very soon. And uh, to the best of my understanding, I, I imagine that Debashish is looking at a concept like enlightenment and how it is used in the Eastern philosophical traditions where enlightenment refers to a spiritual awakening, a letting go of ego and an opening up of consciousness to uh, the higher uh, points of awareness. Uh, you could call them the siddhis or an awareness that uh, Atman is Brahman, that the deepest essence of each sentient being is the same as the whole universe, as opposed to the Western idea of enlightenment, which uh, is 
noticeable in the 18th century and some extent in the 17th century, which is that the highest human function is rationality and that we have the ability to think things through. Uh, people would say that, uh, and, and people such as, uh, Debashish would say that, you know, the, the Eastern view is a broader, larger view of, uh, enlightenment. And I tend to agree. I tend to agree with that. And, uh, well, uh, we've just gotten through one more page. There are, <laughs> there is still many dozens of pages of questions to go through. So I believe I will, uh, continue to address them because we're getting such good questions and it provides me with uh, a good opportunity to continue, uh, these, uh, in the monologue format. Before I end, Today, I want to remind those of you who do not yet subscribe to our free weekly newsletter that if you go to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation, that's New Thinking Aloud, A-L-L-O-W-E-D, all one word, dot O-R-G, and you'll find that there you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter and you can also access our new searchable database that includes all our videos you can put in any search term. It'll take you to the exact spot in each of those videos where the search term is discussed. And you'll be surprised, I think, to see that uh, the database includes other videos, not just our own, but similar videos on YouTube. And with that, once again, I want to thank you very much for being with me. And let me leave you with a question. What was your most profound spiritual experience? <laughs>